got it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and I am here with literally what turned into be our fan favorite from our 30 day shadow work challenge that we just did. And I don't even think I was, we were just chatting before we started filming. Morgan, I don't even think you knew that I, I didn't bother to tell you. <laughs> I had no clue about this. Kind of fantastic, though. <laughs> Oh, and I'm so excited too, because honestly, I've had this platform for about three years. And once again, guys, I apologize. I am right in the middle of Atlanta, Georgia, and they are building high rises next door. So if you guys hear hammering and stuff, that's what's going on. But um, no demons in the room with me. It's just construction. Um, but I mean, I, or maybe there is. Who knows at this point? It's just, it's strange times we're living in. So yeah. Um, I, I literally am so excited because the three years I've had this platform, I've only had one other person, and that's my best friend who came on for a show who I met in India, that's coming from the Ashtanga lineage too. So I'm super excited to be able to not only have someone who's a peer of mine, a colleague of mine out there in the world teaching this very, what I feel like is a very beautiful practice, very sacred practice, but also you're, you're, the topic we're going to talk about, you're kind of coming from it through the same lens that I've you know, come through the same type of lineage, which all of the old ancient practices from Tai Chi to martial arts, they're literally all kind of pointing you in the same direction with just different kind of ways to do it. But before we get into that, guys, before we get into the, 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 the conversation at hand, I do want to go ahead and share with you guys. Now, most of you guys are already following Morgan, more famously known as a strong nurse. But if you're not, this is his awesome uh, uh, YouTube page. He's got some great, not only does he have obviously asana stuff or posture work stuff, but he's got a lot of great just little snippets of video about the practice kind of off the mat, which is really what's important, right? Um, which we're going to get into. And then obviously here his, is his website for his business, which we're going to get into. You do acupuncture, you're a nurse, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm going to put all these links down in the description box below, guys. So um, you can go and check him out as well. So Morgan, let's get started. You're over on the other side of the country in California. How are you doing today, first of all? Um, I, I got a little bit of a like a wind cold, like a head cold sort of thing. Um, my little guy probably brought this home either from the airplane or from, you know, the Petri dish known as preschool. Um, and so, uh, like, I'm probably talking like a, a little bit couple decibels higher at least in my head and like <laughs> ends ends are really difficult to like enunciate you know when you have like congestion going on in your nose so um you know trying to take a deep breath but yeah no uh otherwise yeah life is uh life is good it's you know been a it's 11 o'clock here i think it's one o'clock two o'clock here two o'clock. yeah and yeah. it's you know i mean like it's it's been a full day already at 11 o'clock and like yeah that's the ashtanga life though even though today for us is a moon day but the ashtanga life by like 10 o'clock you're ready for lunch because you've been up <laughs> yeah we did the moon day yesterday and so today is Back like practice go <laughs> yes yeah so yeah for i always laugh like i mean we're so boring i mean we're we're I, I go to bed i mean my my i have a nephew who's 10 years old his bedtime is later than mine absolutely yeah 100 <laughs> you know but that's actually something we're going to talk about in a minute is about uh being a, a parent because a lot of our subscribers here and our viewers are parents and um and that definitely does. I mean, I'm not a parent, but I, I experienced this with my students. It does change your life in a very big way. And um, I was saying, and in, in, in we were talking in one episode, I was kind of explaining between the, you know, the idea of a Brahmin and a householder. And like, even though the Brahmin um, in India, culturally, Brahmin has changed a lot because now they do have families as well. Like our teacher, Sharat Joyce, as well as Guruji, Sabi Joyce had fam I had a family so they have family life too but in, in retrospect too, their life and their culture is very different in India and the way that is addressed and for us who are not Brahmin even if you don't have a family you're still considered a householder because you are not you are living kind of in the matrix you're not often an ashram in India just kind of you know you, you have a very different um and then when you add kids into the mix, uh, there's a great video that you put up um about Thanksgiving and about the holidays oh yeah and actually, let's go ahead. 
because I was going to ask you how you got into this, but while we're on this subject, I'm going to go ahead and ask you a question that my friend Emmy, who is also a, um, uh, was a sponsor of the 30 day challenge and she's a Reiki, uh, a practitioner and she's now gotten heavily into Ashtanga as well. And she, she's a mother of six. She has six kids. Wow. I know. That's a series. I, yeah. Yeah. Girl's fertile. Let's put that way. She's fertile. <laughs> so, but she wanted her question to you was, how has your life changed since <laughs> before having a family? Not even just having a son, but having a wife, having a <sighs> now being like the husband. Like how, when you are a single guy going on a spiritual path, that which I always say, anybody on a spiritual path, and you you probably had just a, a curiosity, like what's the point of life? Like a lot of us did. You know, my friend Cindy says without suffering, there would be no mystic because the suffering is where, where we start asking questions, you know? So what's the biggest difference for you between when you were single Morgan by yourself and now you're Morgan with a wife and a child and a family life? What's the, can you talk about that difference? I, I can. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, do yes, you have three yes, hours? <laughs> I certainly can talk about this difference. Um, yeah, the biggest difference and I guess what's beautiful is I was practicing already. So single Morgan practicing, it's, you know, like it just encompasses me. That's all it was on the mat. You know, I could do my practice as I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted. It looked like what I wanted it to look like. Dating Morgan, um, it was different. It was suddenly there's somebody else in this picture. And, you know, thank the heavens that my wife does not practice asana. Um, because I, I, kudos to those families who do and like both people practice and like understanding those times. I think, you know, that's that in itself takes its own mix and its own toll on it. In this case, um, my wife likes to stay up late and I like to, well, I do go to bed early. I like to go to bed early. I love the early morning time. And so I would get the morning time because she would go to sleep late and she would sleep in while I'm up drinking coffee, meditating, practicing and reading. And then, you know, she would gradually wake up. This is on a weekend because weekdays, it's, you know, a different story. We both go our separate ways and jobs. But so it was, it was a really sort of gentle transition in that way of like, because I'm an introvert. I love quiet time. I love me time. I, I, I need me time alone to sort of process everything and so that's that's where like if both people are practicing they're both on the mat at the same time they're both in the same room at the same and it's like there's to me that would it would just i i pull back into some some place that i wouldn't like to go to and so this way it worked out great we both got our times alone to do what it is that we both enjoy doing alone on our own and having our alone time. And then when we were together, it was just stronger um, because she likes to run. I have a history of running. So we would go on runs together and then we would go rock climbing together and we would do all of these activities that just brought us closer together. But at that same point, we both had our separate times and, um, you know, yin and yang, whatever, however you want to like separate it. It's the duality of those both really, really helpful. Now we throw a kid into the mix and the kid just, he's like the Tasmanian devil and he's not a devil, but he's just like that, that whirling uh, dervish of sorts of like just, just spins and he gets up when he wants to and he goes to sleep sort of when we make him go to sleep, but he, you know, he operates fully like single Morgan used to operate just <laughs> on his own, you know, like I, this is what he would do. And so, so now there's this, well, how do I practice and where, wh what's the time frame that I get to practice? And at, at one point I was waking up like India times, like two thirty, three 3 o'clock in the morning, just to, facilitate 30 minutes of practice before he would start, you know, his day of what he was doing. And then 
um, my wife, Stephanie would wake up and it was just, you know, like <laughs> we were falling apart. And I mean, the yeah. first six months of any like newborn is just, uh, it's, it's chaos. It's a happy chaos. It's a, it's chaos. Um, but the practice was still there. And, and, and to me, it's become like a bedrock, a foundation, something absolutely necessary. Um, and so uh, he's now two and his timing is a little bit more organized. I might want to say is a good word for it. So he's generally up around six, six thirty. So I do have time now in the morning to get up, practice, have, have coffee, enjoy like me time. Yeah. Some mornings he wakes up early because, you know, like I'll jump back too loud or whatever. And then it's, you know, like da da up. It's like, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> All right, buddy. <laughs> Let's go up. And well, I'm sure so, that will change too, as because yeah, your your child is so young right now. It's and I and I've seen my sister, my sister has three kids now, and my friends have kids. It's like you're in the hospital and they just hand you this baby and they're like, Okay, have fun. And you're like, wait, I'm supposed to keep this alive? Like you yeah. know, you know, and you don't know what to do and, and you're free. And I know the first child compared to the last child, like the last child a little bit easier because you've been through it a few rounds, but you, your child is so young and we do have people who are now starting in a, on a spiritual path and using their body this time as a modality, but they have children that l their lives literally depend on you being yeah. able to get them out of the crib and change their diaper and feed them, especially for women. If you're breastfeeding, I mean, you literally have to use your body as, as my sister would say, I'm the milk lady. I'm the walking McDonald's like pull right up, you know, it's, and at that point, it's not really your body anymore because it's being used to, for a life that you're responsible. And so, but there's something I've said this to Emmy. It's like, it's one thing if we're looking at, cause I talk about friction a lot and we see that in friction is necessary. Like why I talk about the match, you know, if you have a match, it has the match has everything it needs on it to light, but it can't light itself unless there's the friction of the strike. And if we're looking at, you know, even though Ashtanga yoga itself is, and I always laugh, I say we're all masochists who do Ashtanga yoga because of the demands of the practice are unbelievable compared to other lineages. And um, most of us are type AAA personalities, you know, that that will do this. And a, a lot of us do have like two hour practices for the bulk of our, our which changes with children. You can't, you don't mm -hmm. have the two hours to devote or the energy. That's the thing too. Um but when we're looking at this idea of friction, yes, the physical fraction, uh, practice gives you that friction through the sweat, through the tapas to create the different patternings. But then we see in life, there's also these opportunities to observe this friction too. And even though childbirth and having children is a beautiful thing, it's also friction. And so there's this beautiful opportunity to grow spiritually in that as well and taking on a partner sharing your life with someone and it is difficult i will admit i it, i've dated multiple people in the ashtanga world it is it is a pain in the ass you want to talk about arguments you cannot your boyfriend or girlfriend cannot be your teacher they could be the best teacher in the world but they adjust you you're going to argue with them <laughs> so if there's 100 percent agree yeah <laughs> You know, and yeah. I even know in like the main show in India, if you got if you got a husband and a wife or a couple that are both authorized that are going to assist Sharat or if one's going to assist while the other's practicing, you can't go near your, your partner. He, Sharat will not let you go near your partner to adjust them. You have to be on the other side of the room. And I respect that because it does. It, there is a dynamic change. When I used to go practice in the mornings at Ashtanga Yoga Atlanta, the students used to laugh that I needed a bell because Todd would ignore me. I could literally be doing vinyasa flow and he would, I would be kicked. I mean, he would, he would just, cause he, and he would look at me and be like, I'm not your teacher. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, but I need help. <laughs> so, you know, there is that, 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 um, that kind of that, um, it, it, I, 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 and so that there is something very, a blessing when your partner is not involved in the same path you're involved in sorry that sounds really gross coming outside but um you know so i, I say that we had a lot of people asking about the challenge well my, my husband doesn't want to do this or my wife doesn't want to do this well first of all everybody's th spiritual path is very different everybody's karma is very different and so you do have to respect that but back to the whole family thing when you're bringing on these these energies into your life 
even though you love them, there is friction and friction is necessary. So in that retrospect, I, I often think people who have kids, who have, you're almost taking on the harder practice at that time. Yeah, and much, a lot of respect to anybody who already has the family and then goes and tries to start a new practice or to start any sort of thing because it's, it's, I guess what I want to stress to anybody who's, you know, starting out with all these things already is to um, picture it as almost as if you, it's a puppy, you know, like it's, it's this puppy dog that you've picked up and um, you, you gotta be gentle with it. You know, at first you're carrying it down the street because it's this little puppy and it's not really walking yet and like figuring its own legs out. And so walk with it for a little bit and, you know, fall off, come back and just, you know, play, make it, make it a game of sorts. And then, you know, you can start to add in things, go a little bit deeper, you know, so maybe you're only practicing those 20 minutes, like three times a week or twice a week. And it's just, you've, carved out that bit of time um and you know work your way up to something it's like so a lady who's in gestation it takes nine months for this thing to develop inside of you um and within that nine months there's so many things that are layered and changing and you know the the frequency that you have to go see your gynecologist and like all these like separate positions that come up and so um, that's the same as like taking on a new practice. So taking on an Ashtanga practice or taking on a surfing practice, or if you decide to go running and that becomes like your practice, um, it, it needs to be a gradual process and not something where like, I'm committing to six days a week, two hour practice. It's, it's not sustainable. It's not healthy. Um, even like, uh, as an acupuncturist, when I'm consulting with people and we're changing diets and like uh, arranging things that are a bit more helpful to them, I never say like, stop what you're doing or, you know, stop this. I, I always give them like, these are foods that I want you to include this week within your diet. And I don't care when you include it, maybe once or twice, you know, throughout the week, but let's just put these three or four foods in your diet this week and let's see how that goes and so with the addition of that anytime you're adding something there's definitely going to be something that falls off and so that's where you gradually add up into um, a full practice for anybody and it's so interesting you're talking about india times because that is when you're in. i'll never forget my first trip to india my best friend and i were living together and we were like a couple months in and we got bumped up to the earliest slot. And so you are getting up at like two o'clock in the morning, your alarm's going off. And I'll never forget in those apartments in India have marble floors. So everything echoes both of our alarms going off on our phones. And I heard my, my best friend from the other side of the apartment go, this is bullshit. Like it's so loud. <laughs> And the whole time walking is pitch black dark outside. You got the street dogs going crazy at night. Some of the lights are working, you know, to the shala and he, the whole time he's like, this is bullshit, this is bullshit, like the whole time I'm getting, and, but, but you look at that too. And, and I, and, you know, and we come into the Ashtanga. So for those who don't know, the Ashtanga lineage is one of three remaining lineages, traditional lineages left next to Iyengar and Sivananda yoga. Don't know much about Sivananda yoga, know a little bit about Iyengar, but we do practice really early in the morning. And that's because of Brahma Murtha, which goes back and it's the, during the Vata time, it's about an hour or so before the sun rises. And there's very spiritual purposes behind this. But I, I often think, and I, I, you know, I laugh and say, I get up now in the morning at the time I was going to bed in mm. my, my after in college. And when I was, after college, I lived in Los Angeles too. I was at the Viper Room all the time. But for me, it's like at being able to take on a serious and I think you go through phases where you are very strict and very and then you and then you ease up a little bit right mm -hmm. you ease up a little bit but I always say I'm so glad I had those moments in my my 20s to be able to be up all night partying because I would not appreciate that now that I do get up between 3 30 and 4 now you know because it is such a you know there's so much more to life and I, we, I see this a lot in the Ashtanga practice as well where people become so dogmatic 
that they almost forget to live their life as well. That the practice is supposed to fuel your life. It's You're supposed to be experiencing your life. And having children, having a family is part of that. We're not... One time in conference in Miami, Sharat made a joke about Sharat Zar, the Parm Guru, he's our teacher in India now, about how all of us were putting our pictures of our handstands on Instagram. And he was like, you've seen Cirque du Soleil? I've seen eight times. They do it better. Like, what? you're a yoga student. Like, whoop-de-doo. You know, so you can do a hand, you know. And um, But before we get to that, because I do want to touch on that a little bit. Briefly, Morgan, how did you find Ashtanga Yoga? Yeah, I, okay, I moved to Chicago in 2007 for nursing school. Um, I was living in Colorado before that, and in Colorado I was um, no yoga, uh, I, no asana. I My yoga was running. I would run distance. Um, I, I would just lace up shoes and just run through the mountains. I lived in a tiny mountain town. Um, where it was easy to run, you know, like five, 10 miles on a single track trail out into the middle of nowhere, you know, in the snow, whatever, like just like just doing it um, wasn't easy, but like, you know, it was, it was, that was, was my yoga. That's yeah. How you and, yeah. Yeah. And so I moved to Chicago and it's a different type of cold than Colorado cold. And I grew up in Miami, so I don't like cold. Um, it's not my like, ooh, yay, this is snow. <laughs> this is fantastic. No, snow is like... Atlanta, Georgia, snow. right here. It's 74 like, degrees outside. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I gravitate towards heat. I like the heat. I like the ocean. But I moved to Chicago because it had large body of water, had a city. I didn't want to be in Miami anymore, so I was you know, happy to be somewhere in a city, big body of water, it had every, like all of these little check marks to it that I was looking for. And so I would go, you know, crazy distance running along the lake or through the city after work. And um, I met up with a friend from high school and she's like, oh, you should go hang out with my, with my buddy, Matt. He, goes and practices yoga at this place. And I was like, cool, I can't touch my toes. Let's go do this, you know? Like, and um, <laughs> yeah, you know, like super, super stiff. Cause you know, I would, I would ride my bike to and from work and to and from college. And um, so yeah, hamstrings are tight. And then I would run after work or, you know, however it would kind of balance out. So yeah, I'd go to the, you know, and Sundays I would just go to this one yoga class that my friend was going to. And it was a struggle. It was, you know, I was like, wow, this is, this is cool stuff. Like I, I'm finding that, that sort of, you get a runner's high at about like three or so miles into it. And I was like, Hey, you know, I'm sort of finding the same runner's high on six feet by two and a half feet, you know, uh, distance. And I didn't have to, you know, traverse outside in the cold and, you know, put on stockings and hats and mittens. And uh, I was like, this, there's potential here for something. And so Sunday class became Sunday and uh, my day off was Tuesday. So it was, you know, Sundays and Tuesdays, I would go to this yoga class. And then it became like, oh, well, I could, go to this Wednesday night class too. And so I would like skip around to these different, uh, <laughs> to use a, a Todd uh, Bowman from Chicago euphemism, it was like a chow chow flow class. <laughs> and so <laughs> I went from one chow chow flow to the next chow chow flow. And, um, and then just got involved in the yoga studio there and Kino from Miami was coming up to do a workshop for a week there. And I was like, Oh cool. This is some lady from Miami. And we went to like rival high schools and I got to go check this out, you know, and see what, what she's offering. And so she came and she did this Mysore class. And the first Mysore class I had, you know, had my little sheet of like, you know, these are the asanas. And I started to do some and I was like, oh, I don't like this one. I'll do this one. And, you Very know, skip to this one. And it was, yeah, it was like my, my own chow chow flow. There was no teacher. And so here I am doing whatever it is that I wanted to do on these, you know, this cheat sheet. It was like a Lino Melee uh, yeah. 
you know, it was like primary and intermediate. So I was like picking from primary and intermediate. I was just like having Let a blast. You know, in this class. Talking, okay. <laughs> yeah. you know, and like here's everybody else, not everybody else, but they're, you know, for the most part, everybody is so structured and regiment and, you know, and they're looking at me like, what are you doing? You know, like, <laughs> don't do that. I'm like, but I, I like this. I can, I can do this. And oh. then Kino gave a talk uh, later that week or maybe that evening. And she started talking about the structure of Ashtanga and how the system is set up and that like, you know, one posture leads to the next and each thing kind of builds upon it. And she gave this really beautiful story about you, you, uh, throughout life, you're, you're walking through a sugarcane field and, you know, you're hacking down through these sugar canes to get to, you know, whatever direction it is that you want to get to. And suddenly, you know, you whack down the bush and there's an alligator standing in your path and you're like, oh shit. So you run back down to the beginning and, you know, you get so disoriented when you get back to the beginning that you start hacking back down the same path again, you know, and then suddenly there's this alligator all over again. And, and so you run back and it's like, well, how many times are are you going to beat down through this path you know you like carve this ground and so she's talking about some scars in this sense and like you know leading up to the same alligator versus like you can either challenge it and like continue to beat down through that and go past this alligator and like meet the alligator confront it head on or you can change direction and you can avoid the alligator this route, you know? And so maybe that's your karma. Maybe that's your dharma this time is to not face this alligator. You don't have the tools within your belt. And so you veer off 10 degrees, but you've changed your direction. And so now there's no alligator. There's none of these like triggers that continue to come up. And so you're like, oh, well, I've got this whole new path. And she's like, it just begins by, and so this is in the workshop and she's like, it, it, begins by unrolling the mat every morning and for six days a week all you need to do is just ache them inhale take the arms up and then you can roll the mat up you've done your practice for the day you've just set your intention that you've changed your direction just just you know like 10 degrees on your path of whatever your path used to be and i was like oh I could challenge myself to this. It's like that, like Lay's potato chip bag thing, bet you can't eat just one, you know? And I was like, bet I could do this six days a week for six months. Let's, let's put this into action and into practice. And, um, yeah, there, there were some days that I was, you know, like I lived above a bar in Chicago. So there were some mornings I was really hung over, <laughs> you know? And so it was like, yes. Okay. Inhale. God, that hurts. Okay. <laughs> um, roll the mat up. Done for the day. I, you know, I, I did my challenge. And so that was the gradual progression of how it started for me. And that was 2008. Um, and it just, it, that, that subtle 10% shift, I, I stopped running because I started to find what I needed on the mat and I realized, you know, years later that it was the running, running is great. But for me, I was running, no, I was running from something or, or like running towards something. And I wasn't turning that back into myself. And so that's, that's where the yoga asana started to shift a practice for myself of like, introspective and uh, changing the work that I was doing outside, it really like, you know, came full circle for myself. And so that was, that was the beginning of that. I practiced all through nursing school, um, which presented its own challenges because there were some, you know, like I'd have to bike to a hospital to do clinicals and we had to be there at like 6.30 in the morning and which meant leaving the house at 5.30 in the morning and in Chicago snow, it was just, you know, it's a mess. Um, but when I finished nursing school, I like throughout nursing school, I made myself a promise. I was like, okay, you've committed to all of this. You committed to that six days a week. You, you, you need to reward yourself for all of this 
this time, this effort that you've put in. And so um, when you graduate, you are going to live in the same apartment that you're living in now because I was paying like peanuts for rent. And you're going to take all of the money that you're saving. You're going to live off of whatever it was that I was living off of in school and then, you know, apply that to a savings account. And all of that for six months, I was able to pay off nursing school and I was able to um, save money. And I, my reward, my you know, goal was to go to India and practice in Mysore for two months with Sharat. And so um, that's what I did in 2000 and... 2011 was my first year there. And so, yeah, that just became that ritual. I ask you what, 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 so you, you know, you, you we see your graduate, your, your, graduation into lineage yoga and then all of a sudden you end up in india which it's a, it's a goal for a lot of people in the ashtanga world but a lot of people just don't ever some people don't have the desire to go to india and that's totally fine mm -hmm. um and that's and india itself is its own friction its own teacher especially coming from the western world you're thrown into a, a talk about chaos you know coming that that ride from bangalore to mysore is like i mean after you've been on that you've literally traveled across the world you're jet lagged af and you um and and the, the dry I, I mean i still don't know how they i mean there's like no laws but it works somehow i always the laugh drive now is so much nicer than it was back then that's what todd says a lot when todd was going to the 90s he was like listen <laughs> yeah right so it, i i it, it's it's uh, i have a friend from england who um her first trip to india she was like i think she has ptsd because the drive there was an accident and there were bodies and the driver pulled over and said oh madam you come and so she got out and there's like a dead body right there you know just like it's entertainment you know and um and just the honking then it's very vata it's very vata. you know there's a lot of noise the poverty level is unbelievably shocking when you're when you first enter into and you see people just sleeping on the streets and um I never forget when I first got to uh, Gokulam, which is the area of Mysore where the Shala used to be. Now they've moved it to another area. And someone said, oh, this is like the Beverly Hills of, of Mysore. And I was like, no, it's not. This is gross. <laughs> and I went to other parts of Mysore. I was like, yeah, yeah. That's, oh, yes. yeah that's totally the Beverly Hills. I mean, my first trip there, my bed totally had bed bugs. But like you go into the landlord, and they just look at you and you're like, all right, this is my karma. <laughs> this is what it is. Um, you know, I, I got a kidney infection my first trip to India and ended up in the hospital. And I they put me on narcotics like a painkiller. I've told this story on my channel. And I didn't know they had given me a narcotic because they didn't tell me. And I thought that I'd reached enlightenment. <laughs> I was feeling so good. And I just loved everyone until I got to Sanskrit class. And I was like, I can't see the board. The board is blurry. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm high. I'm high right now. <laughs> you know. So that's just India. That's just the way it is. Um, you know, it's just and I miss it. I'm, I can't wait to go back because you do miss it when you've been away. It's um, you do miss the the the. But that's like it's a controlled chaos. It's like it, and that's life, right? And and I love that that story you shared about about Kino. And I kind of want to tap on two with you. You know, I kind of mentioned this in our emails back and forth, and I know I've struggled as a as a woman. I've struggled with body dysmorphia. I've struggled with, and we do see actually, sadly, you do see a lot of eating disorders in the Ashtanga world. You do see a lot of body dysmorphia in the Ashtanga world. That is one thing. If you're not aware of this as being a problem, the practice will exaggerate it. But the practice is that's what it's kind of doing. It's pointing things out to you. So I just wanted to touch on the athleticism in Ashtanga yoga. Because, and I've said this many times before on my channel, you know, when you watch a video of Morgan practicing or myself practicing or Kino practicing, you're, you're watching years in the making in that video. And I was like you, Morgan, my first time I ever did yoga, I couldn't even touch my toes. I was a runner as well. I was in college. And after I took my first class, I thought it felt so good. I went to the video store. That's how old I am, a VHS. And the only yoga teacher that i knew of but knew nothing about yoga was jerry hollowell from the spice girls she had a yoga video so that's what i bought awesome <laughs> jerry hollowell from the spice girls was my first yoga teacher <laughs> so i ended up from there 
to them being, you know, in India. But um, so that's a very, you know, obviously we can laugh at those kind of things, but I couldn't touch my toes either. And now it's, it's relatively easy to put my leg behind my head. And but that's, but when you're seeing, and I, I tell my students all the time and my viewers do not compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 10, because there's mm-hmm. value in chapter two through chapter nine. And just because you're seeing somebody's practice on a YouTube channel doesn't, you're missing all those chapters that happened before, you know? And so, and, and I, and I, and I tell my David Greek uh, out of Philadelphia was my first like original teacher before I started, I would travel up to Philly to practice with him. And he used to say all the time, and I loved it that the people who struggle in primary series, their karma came up early. They're the lucky ones. And that is, that's the difficulty of it. It takes years. I mean, I'm still learning from, I'm still learning things from primary series still, Mm -hmm. still. And so, and and I wanted to express that. I wanted to kind of focus on that for a bit. When we're looking at these asanas in Ashtanga yoga, no, Morgan is not choreographing it. I'm not choreographing it. We're taking it from a system that's been in place for a very long time. With that being said, there is some wiggle room that you can make with different students. And I'm going to, that's a question I'm going to ask you in a minute, actually. But when you're looking at like the half primary series, for some people that can take a while Mm -hmm. because of whatever patterning is in their body. And that's okay. You know, I say David Gree used to like, he would have like the young 20 year old girls who were cheerleaders or gymnasts and he'd be like, whatever, next posture. But when a 60 year old man would walk in who was overweight and couldn't touch his toes, oh, he got so excited because now we have something to work with. There's the alligator. There's the resistance. Now we have something to work with. And so I wanted to really express that because for me, backbending is like, where shit gets real on my mat. I mean, I punched Kino's husband, Tim Feldman, mm-hmm. in the face coming out of Kaputasana one time. Only person I've ever hit. It was totally just instinctual. I just whacked him right in the face. Then I, then I threw up on him in India, too. So, <laughs> so <laughs> there's obviously a star there. That yeah, must be Tim. You know? I love that guy. <laughs> nicest guy in the whole world. He's the kind oh. of, um, kind of happened to a kinder guy. But, um, but I tell my students, you know, where where you're comfortable in the practice, like you were saying, you were picking the postures that you enjoy. That's not really where your practice is. It's where it's where where you have to be real. It's where where honesty comes up, and that happens in the places where you struggle. That happens in, in that. And so I, I want to really express that with the students. Like here you are hearing Morgan say he had a hard time touching his toes. I had a hard time touching my toes. But the body changes, the patterns change, the friction gives you that opportunity to change. And I'm so glad you talked about taking it slow because it's not, could you imagine going from living a typical matrix life to all of a sudden overnight waking up at two o'clock in the morning and doing Mysore? Oh my God, you, your nervous system would go into, go into shock, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I had a question from a student. Now, we have a student at Ashtanga, or a viewer, not a student, a viewer. We have a, a student at Ashtanga Yoga at Atlanta who has several palsy. And he will never finish primary series. There are things that his he just has limitations. And I always tell my students and my viewers that, in my opinion, this student at Ashtanga Yoga Atlanta is the most advanced student there. Yes, we have people practicing third series. But he comes in that shala every morning and he's already got obstacle. He already has his resistance Mm -hmm. and he comes and he gets on the mat and he focuses and he's got to be adjusted a lot. He needs a lot of help. But instead of jumping back and jumping through, because the jump back and the jump through, which takes years to get, by the way, guys, I get a lot of questions about that. That can take a while. Don't think you're going to learn it one week. (laughs) It's going to take a while. But for for our student, I almost said his name. I'm not going to say his name, but for our student, he does Navasana instead of jumping back and jumping through. You know, there are things you can do to meet, so that so the practice can meet you where you are. And so this brings me to a question from a viewer. Morgan, would you consider making a half primary series video with modifications for your channel? I've considered it. I've considered making my, uh, a half primary, quarter primary. I, I've considered these these options of making a modifications video the reason i haven't and i 
probably won't is because the modifications are specific to a person. Just like the modifications to your student with CP, um, it's, it's modified specifically to them. And so when I work with, so I, I teach only three days a week now. And on Sundays, I do a lead primary and I teach it in a different way than it's been taught to me. Um, and I, I focus on different aspects of it, um, even differently than what I've cued in videos that I uploaded to YouTube. Um, because my own practice, the way I see it has changed. And the reason I wouldn't go into making a video to address these modifications are a, there's too many modifications to ever address in one single video. Um, B, it does a disservice to, to the individual to get all of these modifications and then say like, well, which one is right for me? And that's where it comes into play of like being a teacher and having understood body types, physical postures. So when, when I'm teaching students now, one of the first things that I'm looking at when a new student comes in the room or even, you know, like an old student has come back into the room or when I'm physically with like, you know, teaching a one-on-one -on -one private online, um, the first thing that I look at is their pelvic tilt because that sort of determines what, what aspects we need to work with within their body. Um, so the first thing being most people, it's hard to say like most, but you know, I, I'm not going to throw out figures, but a lot of people have this anterior pelvic tilt. So it means that like back bends for them fairly easy because their back is always in this, you know, displaced back bend. And so, um, for, for those students, I tend to, discourage back bends. I tend to discourage any upward facing dog puncher position. In fact, I, I have them keep their hips on the ground and only lift from the thoracic part and only tilt from here. Um, like from, you know, T12 up, um, so that they're not exacerbating and creating more I hesitate to say dysfunction, but it's it's in it's in a way they're creating more dysfunction if they have this anterior pelvic tilt and they keep doing back bends. So they're just reinforcing bad behavior. It's like, um, you know, if somebody were to give my kid, you know, a, a cookie and then he starts crying and it's like, oh well, here's another cookie. I'm like, well, screw you, you know, like th this is this is my kid, you know, like fuck off. Like, I'm the aunt that's done that, to be honest. No, and you know, <laughs> occasionally to be the aunt, the aunt who does that is fine. And you know, to do that in a chow chow flow class, it's totally yeah. fine. But to do it on an everyday basis yeah, is just reinforcing this behavior yeah. that it's okay for him to cry because crying equals cookie. And so for that, you know, anterior pelvic tilt person, that individual, I'm going to modify things so that they're, they're changing that. And for a posterior pelvic tilt person, well, they're the ones who don't like doing back bends. And so, and they're the person that I'm going to work with uh, different asanas to exaggerate, not exaggerate, but to help with this, this changing of the pelvis. And so that's the kind of the first thing that I'm looking at with individuals. Um, and then, you know, we have to go into, well, do they, what's their range of motion with their shoulders? Like, do they have this, you know, external rotation? Like, um, I, I have a patient who, uh, you know, he's a pitcher for, for softball, right? Um, well, softball's underhand. I don't know, but he, he was a pitcher like back in high school and through college. And so he has this great external rotation, but he has very little internal rotation. And so we do movements specific to building up this internal rotation for him so that he can gain more movement. And so we look at the asana practice as a way to develop functional range of motion 
so that they can go about and enjoy these other aspects of their lives. Um, yeah. You know, five years ago when I uploaded some of these videos or three, I don't know how many years ago, but like when I started uploading these videos, I would just upload the videos and count out the chant as it had been taught to me. But, you know, like, like everything, God, I hope it evolves. And so yeah. like my teaching has evolved. And so now like the lead class that I teach on Sundays, I teach a lot of, you know, focus on leg internal rotation or external rotation or, you know, when you're, when you're, when you go around and you bind in Ardha Bhada Pada Pashimantanasana, right? Like you, you take the leg up into Padmasana position, you automatically like anteriorly pelvic tilt to get into this posture. You come into a slight backbend in the, in the lumbar region. And so, you know, people are doing this and then suddenly they're reaching forward and they give out and they, their hips go into this posterior pelvic tilt. And it's like, well, wait a minute, uh, that wasn't, that wasn't what the structure of this was supposed to be. You know, they're, they're doing it to look like the magazine, to look like Instagram, to look like what they've seen versus if you keep this anterior pelvic tilt and you keep this lift of the chest through it, well, then you suddenly feel the activation of the quadricep muscle to find tension on the hamstring muscle. And you're like, I could stay here and this is where I need to stay. I don't need this to look like this because that's not is, working. Sometimes less is more. Yeah. And that's, that, that's the intelligence. And that's kind of what happens. I too think too, is like when you first start practicing, you're so focused on the gross body of what's, but then you, you do develop an, a knowing of the inner body, of the of subtle body, of, of the subtle. And I love that you're talking about this because, yes, and I keep telling my students or my viewers, I tell my students too, but they already are my students, you really yeah. do need a teacher. That's part of the parampara. And, yes, you know, because we all have blind spots. And, you know, and, and we're looking at what, what Margaret's talking about this is, the, 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 and that's actually going into another question somebody asked, how has your education and, and nursing and acupuncture of informed your practice? But mm -hmm. everything we talk a lot about on my channel about, you know, Patanjali and the sutras calls it, you know, the three superstars are Prakriti, Purusha, Ishvara. Pra Prakriti is the nature. It's anything with a birth, a life, and a death that's changing. Purusha is the eternal. Atman, the soul, whatever you want to call it, that's watching. That's watching what's happening. You know, we also can say that the bhakti is, or the body is the shakti. It's the expression of the soul. So what he's talking about with all these atomical things going on is somebody's karma. It's their work. It's their Shakti. And so these are really important things that, you know, and, and I, and I hope people through the challenge kind of start to see it this way, just because your body's going in one direction instead of the other, that's not a punishment. It's just something that you, that's what David Grieg was saying. That's your resistance. That's what you're working with. And he, and, it, and it is true. It's caused by, you know, I always laugh that, um, you know, Pashasana, the first posture of the second series, which is a squat and a twist. And a lot of white people can't get their heels down because of our culture. We, um, I can't get my heels down in it. Uh, our Achilles heels, we have Western toilets. We, our kids from a very, my nieces and nephew, when they were really little in diapers, they would squat and play. But now they're in school. And so that's obviously changing the patterning of their bodies. And so Sharat, our teacher in India, if you are someone who's from the East, he will make you get your heels down in that posture. But if you're a white person, as long as you're binding, you're good because it's going to take a while for that pattern to break itself. And um, my, my best friend, again, who is uh, from Canada, he's of Asian descent, though, but he grew up in, in Toronto and he was in the Shala and he was doing Pashasana and Sharat kept yelling at him to get his heels down. And he stood up in the middle of the shawl and he looked at Sharat and he goes, I'm Canadian. <laughs> Sharat was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and afterwards he was like, should I explain to him what a banana is? I was like, no, just don't even worry about it. Like, I'm white on the inside. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 don't even worry about it. But it was just the funny, he's like, I'm Canadian. Like my heels are not going to go down. Um, True. Because even though he's Asian and his parents are from Vietnam, he grew up in Toronto. Very different karmic mm -hmm. circumstances from Vietnam to Toronto that are going to karmically affect you. You know, I laugh about, you know, as far as I've, I've told my students this so many times, the temperature in, in the shawl in India, two temperatures, windows open, windows closed, and they don't really make a big of a difference. You know, 
and the the condensation that falls off of the ceiling onto your mess so gross it's so gross <laughs> so gross uh, but i think some yeah. things i don't miss honestly <laughs> like. um and i laugh because i have some friends who are like from norway like northern europe and i'm like the people from georgia and florida are fine in that heat practicing but you see those people from copenhagen and they're like swaying you know so this is all just karmic stuff that affects us and informs the body and informs the nervous system it's it's just what you're working with and, and i do hope i express that for people watching especially if you're just now fine first of all if you just now found the ashtanga system i'm jealous because the beginning is the most magical you know then you get a little jaded no i'm just kidding <laughs> but you know don't don't expect your body to all of a sudden, just in a matter of a few weeks, look like Kino or look like Morgan or look like LaRuga or look like these big teachers, because that's not the point. It's not the point. You, you're not you're not a Cirque du Soleil performer, as as Sherat would say. And circling back to what we were talking about in the beginning, this is about you, your soul knowing itself. And we use the body as a way. It's almost like we use the prakriti, the thing that is going to expire one day as a way to test our attachment to that thing that is not eternal. And so how willing are you to kind of surrender to your work? And, you know, um, Todd often says, because you guys, if you guys, I mean, listen, I tell people all the time, I'm dead serious. Fourth series looks like a damn exorcism to me. I have a really hard time watching people do it. May, oh, like it just, it's so gross. I, I can, there's some postures where I'm like, your body's not supposed to bend that way. And, and you only really see it a lot in India. To be honest. Yeah. Um, but I tell people all the time, you know, and, and, and Todd has said this, like the reason why there are six different series in the Ashanga system is so that every single person meets a challenge. So if you have to get to fourth series or fifth series before you freaking feel something, then that's, that's kind of a shame the lucky ones are feeling things in primary series who so do not judge yourself based on your athletic abilities in this practice that's not what this practice is for you know you think about the days before instagram even existed i don't think people were as actually todd tells a funny story that when he was practicing in the old in lakshmi Puram. I guess it's the old old shala now <laughs> since they have moved again the old old shala uh, the house that they lived in that there was a student that was in like fifth series or something and and Guruji would come and put, like have to put her in the pose you know literally put her and then he'd walk away and she would be like psst, psst, to Todd who was practicing beside her to push her over so she could actually get out of the pose <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know like why why do you want i have a friend a good friend who did practice through fourth series now she's a mom and so she's pulled back but she said honestly it's not sustainable mm -hmm. to do that every day and so i want people watching this to understand that there is primary series is my favorite out of all the series it is my favorite it is the most grounding it is to me it, it makes the most sense um it, it's it's just it's beautiful and, and, and the fact that you can take you know, a one posture. I mean, look, look, Marie Chastanidi, I tell my students all the time, people write blogs about Marie Chastanidi. You know, just being able to, people will dislocate their arm just to catch the damn vine. But, you know, it's like, I, I said this in a class once, I was told by a teacher, this binding's re relatively easy for me, but it's because I'm long and lanky. I had a teacher say, oh, you got gorilla arms, so you can catch this vine. And the whole class, I had a complex. I was like, I have gorilla oh, arms. Yeah, it's too long. <laughs> yeah. I have a complex after that. But yes, you know, if you have shorter arms, and Kino is one has talked about that, is having that's where you're working then to be able to extend out through that. It's just your work. That's all it is. And I, I, I know as a teacher myself, I don't it doesn't impress me as soon as practice is not what's is not what's gonna impress me as a teacher. Their dedication is their kindness, their integrity, that's what's gonna impress me, not the fact that they I've seen how many people have you seen do handstands, Morgan? Like, you know, it's it's not about that, you know? <laughs> it isn't, it isn't. Um, I, I mean, no, it's not about handstands. It's not about, like, looking like a oh, yeah. particular thing. Um, but, you know, I I feel like... 
yoga in itself is is being redefined it's being it's it's being reshaped it's being challenged it's uh you know from like me too from council culture from all of it like it's all it's all shifting and so you know to like look at yoga are you looking at just the asana the physical aspect of it um or are you looking at you know like these other spiritual aspects of it and and in a physical sense well then it does need some physicality to it to to challenge you know a physical body to to create that and like science science will tell you you know like eight minutes a day is all you need you know to like really build up a, and give yourself you know like 10 extra years of life um just because it's so heart healthy and you know for these different things and so yeah eight minutes of of a challenging work is they're finding in some aspects it's better than you know doing these long hours. two hour practices um they the australian ballet company they've also found that they stopped stretching none of their dancers stretch they all build strength okay no i i get this i actually and get this yeah so so here's here and then becomes like this this asana balance of like where do we where do we define asana is it the stretch to this posture or is it the the development of strength within the posture and so the reason i challenge the the aspect of a handstand is right. i don't know of any other posture where i focus so much other than when I'm trying to pike up or trying to lift up into a handstand. My eyes are incredibly focused in that moment. I know where my breath is at, whether I've held in the breath, whether I can exhale, whether I can inhale. And I, I'm so focused on a physical aspect of the body when doing a handstand that in that instance, within that moment of it, I, I feel like there is so much yoga yeah. beyond asana happening and so yes handstand uh, it's handstand but handstand in that sense of driving this focus of driving this idea of like isn't that what you know all of these drishtis are trying to get yeah. you to and at that to point do? you are correct because i've said this before to my students if you're using asana for the purpose of asana as a tool for this discovery of self then it's the most important thing you do but if you're using asana to show off, then it's the least important thing you do. Mm -hmm. So I get that. I get what you're saying with that. Absolutely. And it's so funny because that's something that um, I've discovered along the way. Even though this practice of Ashtanga is demanding a lot of mobility in the body, the strength is the most important part because that's what keeps the body safe as well. So if we look at just the physicality of the body, the strength is what's keeping the body safe is what's keeping when we forward fold for example in the primary series we're actively forward folding we're not passively we're actively engaged that's the bundus which is then connected to the pranayama to the breath you know you're with the handstand i tell my students i do use this a lot you know the inhale is what's lifting you up you're not going to come into a handstand on an exhale it's just not going to work you know so you start to learn so in that aspect absolutely yes you are right it is it's the tool at that point mm -hmm. it becomes the tool um to, to to understand and know yourself so yes it's um but i just want our viewers to understand that it, it can take years to learn the full primary series it can take absolute years and you are not supposed to there is a purpose for why the practice the, the postures stack on top of each other they do you know you usually have pose counter pose neutral Co pose counterpose like John Yushar Shasana A. That's the quarter primary series mark because that's a neutral pose. It's it's bringing the body back to neutrality. Whereas the postures before it are kind of going back and forth. You know, you look at Uttita Hasta Padangusasana, the first posture primary series where the leg is extended out. I know our our people watching don't know the Sanskrit, but the leg is extended out. The femur bones in a straight line. It's almost like a Navasana, but you're standing up. It's like a variation of that fire. But then the next posture, you're turning the femur bone because the, the foot is coming up into the hip, into a half Padmasana, you're turning the femur bone in the opposite direction. And so there's a counter mobility that's happening there. And so there is this kind of, recipe now again with that and I, I liked how you brought up the modifications because there are literally i mean with each posture there are probably hundreds of modifications that can actually be taken 
And it does, it is. And most people, honestly, I think a lot of people don't even really need modifications. It's just they're looking for that, a way out to make it easier instead of being in the, you know, it's like the, the yeah. Uchita Trigonasana or Triangle, Uchita Trigonasana, people want to block. And it's like, well, when's as, you know, David Greek, who does use a lot of props in his practice, he'll say, but like, when is the best time to give up the block then at that point? Mm -hmm. When do you put it away? You know, when do you put it away and just allow yourself to kind of wobble a little bit? And I, I tell my students too, you know, for me as a teacher, beautiful practices are one thing, but messy practices are where it's interesting. Because where, where you're falling, where you're struggling, that's where it's interesting. That's mm -hmm. where there's information. You know, it's, it's, um, but I know it's almost been an hour, Morgan. So I want to ask you one last question. We've got even more questions here. Okay. Hoping you'll come, you'll come back on for a second round. Yeah, I, I have until 1230. So, okay, um, cool. So I, I could definitely hit another half hour of questions. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Well, we had some, 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 we have an awesome, uh, a viewer that was like, can I trade bodies with him for two decades? I promise. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to. <laughs> well, maybe body, but like the, the aspect, I, you know, yeah. I, well, I heard Kino say one, don't ask an Ashtangi to tell you all their injuries. They have a long list. Don't we yeah. all have a long list yeah. of things that are wrong? Um, and so, but he, he had a, a, a good question um, for each. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, and this is actually one of our viewers who is from Indian um, heritage and, and um, Indian. So um, for each asana, do you consciously reset in your mind to, to, to ensure that you are in the moment within the body experiencing asana as it is? Or and like, do you find, do you have to yourself, Morgan, as a student on that, do you have to consciously, because I know I'm bad about this. If I'm in a part of my practice, that's like easy for me. I'll be thinking about the laundry. I'll be thinking about like my research, what I'm doing. But when I get for me, because backbending is such an issue for me, that's where, you know, we're talking about the handstand, that focus in backbending, yeah. even to this day that's where my mind is like consciously there is because I hate it so much, you know, but, um, but do you Morgan, as a student, do you make sure that you, when you are doing your practice in the morning and you're listening for your kid, are you able to consciously bring yourself into each posture as it is in your body? And if so, how do you do that? How does that work? <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to think ideally that that happens, but yeah, on a day to day basis, aspect of it i i think i'll focus on like two or three asanas and then the rest is like, it's like it's like i'm a marionette you know like um yeah there's 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 moments of of like clarity of focus um i i feel like you know like okay so you take the first couple postures in primary right like Triang Mukha, where you have this like internal rotation in the legs. And so I that one I'll try to focus on this internal rotation and I'll choose day to day. Like, so within that posture, I'm like, okay, well, do I want to focus on my medial hamstring and keep this like internal rotation and then like accentuate this this pelvic tilt? Or do I want to focus on like QL muscles in the back? And so I what I try to do is try to focus on one area because there's just way too many different areas to focus on at any given moment. And so like, I'll take that asana and I'll try to focus on one thing and just one aspect of it. Um, but then I get distracted and you know, and that's, that's normal life. It's the yeah. human, it's, it's the human experience. I don't know one person in this. I mean, I'm sure Sherat even struggles with this where you're, you know, but I mean, it, it does become almost like autopilot. Like I'm bad about this when I teach. So when I teach my classes up in Marietta, I teach one like class up in uh, suburbs of Atlanta on Sundays. And because they don't have my store, um, it's the only Ashtanga class. I do teach it differently where I will count, but I will also workshop as well. And give and give and give cues. But if I were to teach a lead primary down at Ashtanga Yoga Atlanta, I would just count because they've had my sore all week, you know. And um, so I I've admitted this I, when I teach lead classes, even as a teacher, and I'm just counting, sitting on the stool counting. Sometimes I I don't even know where we are in the practice because I'm so on autopilot. Yeah. I've done it so many times 
that I'm literally thinking about daydreaming about something else while I'm counting you through. But in Marriott, it's different because I'm workshopping. But yeah, so even even teaching this, guys, because we, I mean, totally, times, you know, it's it's just it's like brushing your teeth. At some point, primary series becomes like brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. You know, even second series gets that way too, or it just becomes so repetitive. But in that instance too, it's like that's where you know the, the practice shifts and change because you do have the propensity to kind of not pay attention you know good sometimes in that sense of like you're just you're just in some flow you're just moving and some days god that's all you need to do is just yeah. move don't think just move let it let it carry you through and so you skip parvatanasana because that's the posture i always skip for some stupid reason you know right and you, you just skip it you're like oh okay like move on Fair. Just go. i always laugh about that posture because so many people tend to do you know you know for those who are not familiar we 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 want to practice Uddiyana Bandha and Mula Bandha by pulling the belly in in the practice but so many people get in that practice and they like push their belly out it's almost like the the Texas thing the higher the hair the closer to God it's like in that practice the higher the belly the closer to God I don't know but it just but yeah it it um absolutely absolutely well that's another question someone had you know we talk a lot about how as I just said previously how you know the Shakti so you have the Shiva Shakti you have the soul you have the art it's it's deeper than the soul. It's literally the Atman, which is the eternal part of you that is literally just kind of watching you live your life as it's its own reality. You are your own Beverly Hills wives, housewives, Beverly Hills. You, know, you are your own reality show. You're your own Jersey Shore. Your your Purush is just kind of watching it happen. But we know because the Shakti is the expression of the soul, the soul created this physical experience to live in this world that we have this nervous system. We have these thoughts that create emotions. And we have, and as an acupuncturist, which I love acupuncture, by the way, um, we do store yoga chitta vritti narodaha. We do store the chittam, the vrittis coming from the mind stuff is stored within the body. And so sometimes there can be a very real emotional response to a stretching of a muscle to the opposing forces or to some sort of movement some sort of shape you put your body in how has that affected you with the acupuncture with your knowledge of like medical stuff science stuff through the medical industry with the nursing how do you see that all working together do you see like do students who understand this concept, do you see every, I mean, we know we have an inherited karma too, but like this, almost like the psychosomatic thing that's happening in the body. Do you see that more? How do you see that as a, a acupuncture, a yoga teacher, a yoga student, a nurse? There were a few questions in there. Could you yeah. refine it maybe down? <laughs> That's my boss. No, no, because like there's there's a lot and there's a lot to like digest so, with that. But yeah. For example, so again, I struggle deeply with back bending. I've had back I had back surgery at 17. I know there's like a lot of emotional stuff happening there that I had to work through and it, it expressed itself in a very raw and real moment when I literally punched the nicest person in Ashtanga yeah. Yoga you know, coming out of just a physical movement. So as an acupuncturist, as a nurse who sees all sorts of physical limitations and physical obstacles, and now a yoga teacher and a yoga student, how does that like inform you within your practice, within doing acupuncture, within working with students? And do you ever feel, I guess what I could say too, do you ever feel like you're seeing something in a student in the Mysore room and maybe you need to pull them back a little bit because it's opening up. And there's maybe you could feel too much emotion, too much trauma there to actually step into at this moment. Does that does that make sense? Hundred percent. Okay. Let's let's sort of unpack this in a few different situations. One, there's a really good book, and I think it's called like the Body Keeps the Score, something like that. I yeah, have that, I have that book. Okay, yeah. so. But, but that's, that's in this idea of like the brain only has this limited, the brain, like if you look at a computer, right? Like you have your, your hard drive and then you have the RAM, right? And the RAM is the like speed processing thing. And that's what like allows us to do this video communication and everything that else is like stored, you know, on this hard drive. So like 
that after this recording, the file is going to be stored on the hard drive. But the RAM is what's like allowing us to do this right now. The brain, in a sense, is this is this RAM computer, right? Like it's it's running through all of this. But if we want to store this moment, we are going to store it somewhere along the like the meridian channels or into the um or into the nadis or into a muscle musculoskeletal system and it's going to be stored somewhere because everything that is taken in through the five sense organs is processed somewhere we there there are times when it just flows through and we let it go like uh michael a singer will talk about this in the untethered soul of this idea of like some some things we come through and we pass through and they hold nothing to us but then there are other things that like we that like come in and we like have to hold it in and that becomes our karma or dharma of this lifetime and so um with with an acupuncture like if we understand like channel system theories right there the the you know, like one of the first systems to develop is like, uh, it's kind of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best to like explain this in the most simple aspect of terms, like even in, in um, Ayurvedic, where you have like the, the Sushumna Nadi, and then you have the like Ida and Pingali, and they like spin up around it. Well, in, in Chinese, medicine theory you have the the chong which is sort of the same as the sushumna nadi which you know runs dead center and then you have the ren channel which runs up along the front and then you have the do which runs along the back and so you have these these two circular systems that like meet up through this this center pole um and so one of the first to develop is like when I looked at my little guy and, you know, you do tummy time with a little, you know, couple week old kid. And so he's lifting up his head and he's lifting up his neck. And so there's a spot on the low back uh, between um, his lumbar two and three. It's called do four in Chinese medicine. And so it's this it's this area which begins to send a spark to the little guy to, you know, start looking up and start to see past his horizon, right? And so this is what starts to send the spark to, like, move beyond yourself at this moment. And you start to, like, move beyond where you are. And so that's what inspires him to then, you know, start to learn how to use his hands to start crawling across the room. And this, this spot, this do four becomes this, this spark of sense of like, if you see something across the room, if you see a cup of water across the room, it's the spot of do four that's like inspiring you to get up and move to grab this, this cup and drink this cup of water. Um, and that spot, that do four, um, a lot of people have low back pain right in that specific area of do four. Um, and basically, you know, um, whether or not you go for it or not, like you see it and you, you want to go for it or you see it and you hold yourself back, sometimes that, that spark is literally a pain in the ass, you know, like, you know, holding you back or like, oh crap, you know, like I need to go across the room, but I'm in so much pain to go get this. And so there's that there's that aspect of like bringing Chinese medicine into like where we are. There's the, the gallbladder channel, which um, it's you know, the foot Shaoyan or foot Shaoyang channel. And it kind of runs along the sides of the body and zigzags up across the head and back towards the ear. Um, but that's sort of what gives us this ability to pivot. Right. And so when when my little guy was walking, he didn't have that ability to pivot at first. You know, it's just he gets up, he's a straight line, right? Yeah. And you know, a lot of Ashtanga is it's it's very linear, it's very yeah. straight line. Um, but there's this ability to pivot, there's this ability to to shift direction, right? To change. So there's that glass of water, but oh, suddenly there's, you know, a candy bar across the room, some nice chocolate. And you're like, ah, I'll pivot. You know, I want the chocolate instead. I'll and pivot so, with chocolate. <laughs> you know, of course we like chocolate. I don't trust people who don't like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
so it's it's that ability to pivot that then comes into play as we get older is this development of this gallbladder channel like the the foot shao yang but within that aspect when you start to see people in later aspects of life that ability to pivot becomes less and less like i'll see it in my parents right their ability to change with you know my dad, he can still pick up my little guy, right? But he's not picking the guy up and twisting and turning with it or like picking him up from the side. He has to be very mindful of like picking him up straight up. There's none of this pivot anymore. So as we get older, we start to lose this pivot. And so we, we start to lose this ability to change both mentally and physically. We, we lose pivot. And then, you know, we, we get stuck stopped almost in our tracks, right? Like you see people with a cane and they start to bend over. And so then there's that ability of the back to like stand up straight and to have that is then counterbalanced with this like, oh, I'm, I'm hunched over. And so you get this like contraction here um, as we get older. And then, and then you see people that are refined to sitting. And so then they're in this, you know, more of this state and then finally there's the resting state which um you know like if you've done hospice or you've seen anybody in a hospital they're lying down um and so then there's there's that state where they no longer have ability to pivot they no longer have the ability to get up they no longer have this ability to rise like it's it's all of these meridian systems they've they've gotten full they've become full through your lifetime of all the things that you're working through within this lifetime, such as your karma or your dharma, or like this is your your um, these are your some scars that they've they've loaded up through this body through this lifetime, and so that's sort of this natural progression of we, you know, we learn how to stand, we learn how to pivot, and then we stop learning how to pivot, and then we start to regress down. And then we are flat and then eventually is, you know, um, we no longer take this body and we take on a different form. Um, but so, so yes, the body, the body has this magnificent way of, of processing and organizing everything that's coming at it. Uh, it, it's supposed to, it's designed to take these inputs and, you know, work with what it is and what we're trying to do with these asana practices of keeping this range of motion is to allow those those some scars or those those things that are holding on to be processed through the body so that they don't keep that they, they, so that you can keep your processing and functioning longer um so yeah. that you can take your That's karma a little bit longer I, love, I wish I could take a sound bite of that because that was beautiful. And I kept thinking about, you know, the difference between Surya Namaskar A and Surya Namaskar B. And I've been speaking a lot on my channel. We go through a lot of the Sophia codes and the Hathors and the Egyptian alchemy as well, which is, it's all, they, they call it the Jed, what we call Shashumna is the Jed. And I've spoken about the two different nostrils and the chain that the masculine, the feminine energy. And I know masculine energy, and, and guys, we carry both energies, both men and women and women carry both. And, um, Masculine is always very linear, whereas feminine is very reciprocal. And you see that when you're talking about the pivoting. And I was just thinking about like Suri Namaskar A and Suri Namaskar B. And the biggest difference between the two is that in B, you're starting to get the rotation of the hip, you know, but you have to have the A first. The A comes first. So like when you're, but then it's interesting when you, it's like that from cradle to grave, you know, it comes, it starts, and then it it kind of comes back to where it starts again. And that is the definition of prakriti, is that cycle of life. And um, and then being able to, I mean, Richard Freeman says that, like, a part of this practice is being able to accept your own mortality. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and when it comes to be able to let it go, and just, you know, Sri Swami Satitananda in his commentary on the sutra talks about that. Like, the more you kind of lean into that, the more you can, like, let it go when that day comes and not hold on um yeah. so something that's not per that's not hold on a bull anyway like it's not you're not your body's designed to you die like, yeah you're you're renting this flesh right now you know like so that that person who wanted this particular flesh it's just rented you know <laughs> like, it's yeah it's it's not mine anyway so yeah sure you could you could take it if we could figure out how to swap you know like <laughs> yeah. 
I, I'm I'm less attached to this form now than I once was, but I'm in some instances more attached to it because I have this kid and I'm like, oh my yeah. god, you know, like I, I, your life preservation is a little somebody bit somebody else's life is put on yours now. For me, it's just it's my dog, but my dog's a street dog from India, so he could probably out survive me if he. I mean, that's oh, god, cool yes. too. You look at the karma, like these dogs in India. I've brought six dogs back so far. Ravi is is mine, but I look at his hips. You know, we will talk about like a lot of times back to the whole body and the karma thing. Like my dog's hips are so open. Like he like lays in Upavishta Konasana. But those dogs for generations, they have to, I'm sure you've seen them, Morgan. They dive into those deep tunnels to, to hunt rats. They have to be able to like, ugh, but they have to be able to like, you know, get under things. And and that's just their evolution. That's how they, that's how they make. Well, I'm going to ask you one last question. This is a question I was going to end with. This is a viewer request. Um, okay. So many people around the world, because we have people, we had over 600 people. I love Maybe. that. I know. We have another one coming up in January and you're going to be on that as well. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> for <it>. <laughs> I do. I love how you have so the 20 minute beginner video, guys. It was the sun citations mm -hmm. and the fundamental sequence. And that is a beautiful place to start. And that is, uh, we keep students there for a while because there's just, I mean, even I just put up the sun salutations. The sun salutations can be a complete practice in, their, in themselves. It, that's just everything you need is in the sun salutations, right? Um, and a lot of people around the world, I mean, we have people in New Zealand, Australia, um, Africa, Europe, do, doing your videos now. And a lot of them have contacted me because they're trying to find teachers in their area. We know that there's only a handful of us around the world and a lot of studios and shalas shut down because of, depending on what country you're in, how severe your lockdown was, and they just can't find anybody. And so I have some people I'm Zooming with and they wanted to know, is it possible to Zoom with you, to book a, a lesson with you through Zoom? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so... My Sunday class that I teach the lead primary, full lead primary, it's 100% drop in uh, donation, come for free. It's just, it's on Zoom. I can give you the link later. Um, it's, yeah, 100% uh, come, no hesitation. Like, you know, it's it, it's there for you. Um, and it's it's the full primary as as I teach it now. Um, the to to book a private like one-on-one -on -one consultation um we can do like a 15 minute free consultation there's a link in uh on my website uh for right. acupuncture for it um where we're just basically we do some postural assessment and understand like well you should probably avoid this or you should probably go ham on this one and like you know go go full tilt um and that that's just a free consultation i'm happy to like give that out um but if we're doing further one-on-one -on -one consultations yeah they can also book that through the website and um book you know like a block of time it's usually i it's blocked into hours of time and so um my schedule is usually up to date on it because it's all through my electronic medical records through the acupuncture clinic so um yeah and, that, and i've already that. i've already looked through your website it's so easy to work guys i will put that obviously it's going to be in the description box and you'll send me the zoom link what time is your sunday classes so it's like, uh sunday class it's uh it's 8 a.m pacific time so pacific time guys yes um uh, for all of our viewers around the world so whatever 8 a.m on california is for you <laughs> to figure that out with the world clock um look these time i listen i do shows with people in australia i'm like they are 16 hours ahead i'm like this is some <laughs> fucked up shit <laughs> and we know going to india that's some gnarly jet lag mm -hmm. you go through in india um actually in the beginning it's awesome because you're up at like one o'clock yeah it's easy to be up at three o'clock yeah because <laughs> you're but then by like the third month you're you're dragging already but mm -hmm. um so guys so thank you so much morgan i'm gonna i know yeah. i said Catherine edwards everybody she wants to do some stuff with you as well i'm hoping you'll come back on the channel um and continue helping people through we are coming into the age of aquarius so it's very um very um <laughs> interesting i'll just say are you to, to use a rom dos i will talk about rom where he's like interesting interesting that all this stuff is becoming more um I think our ancestors knew this. I think, you know, especially with the energetic body and the meridians and all that kind of stuff, I think, and then we lost touch with that. And now, especially us in the Western world, now we're just 
we're just refining it again. And it's a beautiful experience. It's a painful experience sometimes, but it's, it definitely makes life a little bit more, it enriches your life in ways that um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade this existence for the world being able to do this work because it, it getting to know for anybody watching right now, getting to know yourself is, is a, is a beautiful experience. And um, there are things about yourself that will, you will surprise yourself. You are a lot stronger than you think you are and you are and, and nothing is permanent and nothing, everything is, cha is constantly changing. So, um, so thank you so much, Morgan. I'm so happy you agreed to do this and you didn't like freak out. And you're like, wait a minute, you've been using my <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> life is good you know <laughs> like oh i'm like i don't know if you know but we've been using your links <laughs> for our, people all over the world now are practicing to your videos so so but i and i thank you for putting such calm well-informed information up on the internet for the world to see because that we need more people like that that are willing to share that and especially in such a calm manner for for all of the people around the world especially during this time when so many people are isolated and so many people's lives have been just t turned upside down and carpet pulled out from underneath them and just to have that out in the world so i thank you for doing that mm -hmm. um, so and i know our our, uh, our 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 challengers our viewers will be very excited to see this video and so um say so yes you guys all his links will be down i'm gonna put the books you mentioned i'm gonna put links to those i wrote those down um for you guys as well for those who are wanting to do more study i'll also put a link to the body keeps the score that's a very heavy book i've read that book it's very heavy be prepared if you well, take in. Yeah. yeah if you are triggered easily he, they are going to get into some very intense traumas so um very real traumas so, so just be very prepared if you are um if you want to read that book so anyway morgan thank you so much and yeah. i'll we'll talk to you soon awesome <laughs> sounds good Bye. <laughs>